Okay. So today um, we'll start chapter 15 on acid-base equilibria. And in the previous chapter, we focus on the interactions of acids and bases and learn how to apply the fundamentals of chemical equilibria to systems that involved proton transfer reactions. In this chapter, we'll focus um, on the applications of acid-base equilibria. In particular, um, we'll look at buffer solutions that contain components that enable the solution to be resistant to a change in pH. And we also look at acid-base titrations and see how the pH changes when an acid is added to a base and when a base is added to an acid. And we'll also see how indicators are used to mark the endpoint of an acid-base titration. So in the previous um, chapter, we learned how to calculate the pH of a solution that contains an acid or a base. In this section, we'll um, deal with a solution that contains not only a weak acid, HF, but also its salt, the sodium fluoride. So we have in our solution uh, the hydrofluoric acid and NaF. What are the major species in this solution? Since HF is a weak acid, as we can see from the small Ka value, we know that most of the HF will remain as HF at equilibrium. And NaF, sodium fluoride, is a salt. A salt is simply another name for an ionic compound, uh, which will break into um, ions when dissolved in water. So our major species are HF, the hydrofluoric acid, sodium plus, and fluoride, and water, since we're dealing with an aqueous solution. What is the common ion then? The common ion is the one um, that's produced by both reactions. So in this case, we have fluoride in both reactions. So the common ion is fluoride, okay? So then, what effect does the presence of sodium fluoride have on the dissociation equilibrium of the weak acid hydrofluoric acid. So, if we add F minus to uh, our solution that contains a weak acid, um, we, we know what will happen because of the Le Chatelier's principle. The Le Chatelier's principle states that when a stress is added to a system at equilibrium, the system will shift in the direction that uh, relieves that stress, right? So when we add F minus to the solution, what will happen? Will the equilibrium position shift to the right, to the left, or stay the same? It will shift to the left, right? Because we are adding F minus, so it will shift to the left. So the solution that contains H HF will be less acidic because this equilibrium position is shifting to the left, so we'll have less protons in our solution, right? So this effect, this phenomenon is called the common ion effect, okay? The most um, important um, application of the common ion effect is for buffering, as we'll see in the next slide. But um, in summary, the common ion effect is the shift in equilibrium position that occurs because of the addition of an ion already involved in the equilibrium reaction. Uh, this ion is called the common ion, ion. And this is an application of Le Chatelier's principle. So as we've seen in the previous slide, a solution that contains both um, the weak acid and the salt, the NaF, is expected to be less acidic than a solution of HF alone. Because of Le Chatelier's principle, the equilibrium position will shift to the left, okay? So, um, let's solve a problem uh, related to the common ion effect. Um, take some time to think about this problem and then let's solve it together. So the question says, the equilibrium concentration of H plus in a 1.0 molar HF solution is 2.7 times 10 to the negative two molar concentration and the percent dissociation of HF is 2.7%. Calculate the concentration of H plus and the percent dissociation of HF in a solution that contains 1.0 molar HF 
and 1.0 molar NIF at 25 degrees Celsius. So think about this question for a moment and then um, let's solve it together, okay? Okay, so um, before we do any calculations, let's think about the chemistry that occurs in the solution. So we do this by first listing the major species um, of the solution. So what are the major species? So we have um, um, HF, 1.0 molar HF, and 1.0 molar NAF in our solution. What are the major species? So HF is a weak acid, as we can see from the small Ka value, and NaF is a salt, an ionic compound that will break up completely into its ions when dissolved in water. So HF is one of our major species, and the sodium ion, um, F minus, and water, right? Then which equilibrium will dominate the pH? So we have to think about what possible equilibriums there are that will, can affect the pH, right? We've done this many times in the previous chapter. So what are the equilibriums um, that can dominate or that can affect the pH? So we'll think about, so we have a weak acid, right? Minus, and the other equilibrium that can affect the pH is the dissociation of water, right? How do we determine which one will dominate the pH? We compare the K values, right? The K value for this reaction is Ka. And for this one, this is the ion product, right? So Kw. So which one is larger? So Ka is 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4. And Kw at 25 degrees Celsius is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14, right? So um, Ka is greater than Kw. So the equilibrium that will dominate the pH is the dissociation of the weak acid, right? And the equilibrium expression for this is um, the product of the concentrations of the product, so H plus times F minus over the concentration of the reactants. And this gives this value, okay? So now we're dealing with a weak acid problem now. So we'll use this ICE table to find the equilibrium concentrations and especially we're looking for the concentration of H plus, right? So the initial concentration of HF is 1.0 molar concentration, right? And um, since this is a weak acid, we'll assume we have, we're, we're starting with zero concentration of H plus and with H F minus. Now instead of zero, we have 1.0 molar concentration of the F minus. Uh, if we let X to be the amount that's dissociated from the HF, then we have a minus X, and then for the products, we have plus X and plus X, right? And the equilibrium concentrations of the HF will be 1.00 minus X. For H plus, it's X, and for F minus, it's 1.0 plus X. We can then express the um, Ka value um, using Ka equation using, um, the, uh, using x, right? And um, 
since the Ka value is small, we'll assume that x is much smaller than 1.0. Okay, so we'll make an assumption. If we do that, then x is equal to Ka, okay, since both concentrations are 1. Since we made an approximation, we have to check whether approximations are valid using the 5% rule. And yes, it is. Um, 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4, which is x over 1.0 times 100 is only 0.072%, which is less than 5%. So we know our approximations are valid. Okay, so x, which is the concentration of H plus, is this much. Okay, now what about the uh, the percent dissociation. Percent dissociation is defined as the amount dissociated over the initial concentration, right, times 100. So uh, if we do the math, we get 0.072%. Okay, let's compare our values with um, the values um, for the solution that contains only HF. Okay, so we got um, 7.2 times 10 to the negative 4 molar concentration, right? And for the percent dissociation, we got 0.072%. Um, so if we compare these values, the concentration of H plus and the um, percent dissociation are larger for the one that contains only the HF, right? What does this tell us? This tells us that the presence of NIF, the salt, um, which will um, produce F minus ions, um, shifts the equilibrium to the left. So it will inhibit the dissociation of HF, okay? As, so this is a great example of the common ion effect, okay? Okay, so um, again, the most important application of the common ion effect is for buffering. So a buffer solution resists a change in pH when either hydroxide ions or protons are added. Um, the most important practical example um, of a buffer solution is our blood, which can absorb the acids and bases <coughs> produced in, um, in biological reactions Without, a, without changing its pH. Uh, maintaining a constant pH in our blood is very important because our cells can survive only in a very narrow range of pH. So buffer solutions are either um, weak acids or bases and with a common ion, okay? Examples are HF and NAF. And another example could be a weak base with its um, um, salt, ammonium chloride, okay? So when solving problems with um, buffer solutions, it's best to deal first with the stoichiometry calculations to determine the new concentrations. And we'll, in this step, we'll assume that the reaction with a strong acid or strong base will go to completion. So the um, strong acid will look for the best base and the strong base will look for um, the, uh, the best proton source um, to react. Once we're done with the stoichiometry calculations, um, we move on to the equilibrium calculations. We'll reset up the ICE table and find the equilibrium concentrations to find the modified pH. Okay. So um, here's another problem. Here is a buffer problem. So let's calculate the change in pH that occurs when 0.010 mole of solid NaOH is added to 1.0 liter of a buffer solution containing 0.50 molar acetic acid and 0.50 molar sodium acetate. Okay, we have both the acetic acid and the sodium acetate. The pH of the original buffer solution is 4.74. Compare this pH change with that which occurs when 0.010 mole of solid NaOH is added to 1.0 liter water. Okay, so um, think about this question and we'll solve it together. So I'll give you about one or two minutes. Okay. So,
Okay, so again, we'll first list the major species, okay, before you do any calculations. So what are the major species before any reaction occurs? So what do we have in our solution? We have this buffer that contains acetic acid and a sodium acetate, and we're adding a strong base, NaOH. So our major species are the weak acid uh, in its original form, and we have its salts. So we'll have Na plus and the acetate. And since we're adding a strong base, we'll have Na plus and OH minus, and of course water, okay? So um, let's first deal with the stoichiometry problem. We have to um, focus on the fo major species. So we note that there is a strong base, OH minus is a strong base, which has a great affinity for protons. So it will look for the best proton source. In this case, what is the best proton source? It's the acidic acid. So there will be a reaction between the OH, plus, uh, OH minus and the acetic acid to form acetate and water. So this reaction will go to completion or until all the hydroxide ions are consumed, okay? So let's calculate what we have left after this reaction. So we start out, so we have uh, 0.010 moles of OH minus, okay, which is given in the question. Now let's calculate the moles of um, the acidic acid, okay, the initial acidic acid concentration and the acetate. We do this by multiplying the volume by um, the concentration that gives moles, so it gives 0.50 moles and the same moles for acetate as well, okay? And after the reaction, since all of the OH minus is used to neutralize the acetic acid, we're now left with 0.49 moles of the acetic acid and 0.51 moles of acetate, okay? Now, what are the major species after this reaction? So we used up all the hydroxide ions. So we're left with everything but the hydroxide ions, okay? So we have the acetic acid, Na plus, the acetate, and the water, okay? Now, what is then the dominant equilibrium that controls the pH? So it would be the one that has a larger K value. So Ka, we know Ka is larger than um, Kw. Kw at 25 degrees Celsius is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. So we know Ka is larger than that value. So um, the dissociation of the weak acid is the equilibrium that controls the pH, okay? So now we have a weak acid problem. So we can set up the ICE table <coughs> to find um, the equilibrium concentrations of H plus, right? So um, the initial values were calculated from the previous step, from the, from the um, stoichiometry calculations. So now um, if we set X as um, the moles per liter that dissociates from um, the acidic acid, we get this much. Uh, in, in this case, we'll deal with moles only. We'll um, um, think about the volume later, okay? So 0.49 minus X for the acidic acid and X for the proton and 0.51 um, plus X for the um, acetate, okay? So we can um, express the equilibrium um, expression here, Ka, in terms of X and let's make an approximation. We'll assume x is much smaller than 0.49 uh, because Ka is a very small value. It's 10 to negative 5. So if we do the math um, and solve for x, x is then 1.7 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay? Since we made an approximation, we have to check whether our, our assumptions are valid. So and we use the 5% rule, okay? So x over 0.49 times 100 is only this much, so which is um, um, much smaller than 5%. So we know our assumptions are valid, okay? So now we know the concentration of the proton at equilibrium, which is this much, and uh, we can calculate the pH. pH is simply 
the negative log of the concentration of the proton, right? So pH is then 4.76, okay? So then the change in pH that's produced by the addition of 0.010 mole of NaOH is, so the final pH we got is 4.76, right? And the change in pH then is 0.02, okay? Let's compare this value with the value that um, we get with um, the addition of 0.010 mole of solid NaOH um, to add it to pure water, one liter of pure water, okay? So this is a, a simple strong base calculation, so we know how to do this. The concentration of OH minus is then 0.010 molar, which is the same as the um, concentration of the solid NaOH because this is a strong base which will completely dissociate when dissolved in water. So OH minus is 0.010 molar, and using the relationship between H plus concentration OH minus and KW, we can find um, the concentration of H plus. So again, from the water, from the dissociation of water, we know that KW is equal to the product of the concentration of a proton uh, and the, um, the concentration of hydroxide, okay? So um, the pH is 12.0. OO when NaOH is added to the pure water. The pH of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is simply 7, right? So what's the change in pH in this case? It's 5, okay? We see a large difference in the, in the change of pH, right? So this tells us that our buffer is effective in resisting a change in pH. Okay, are you with me? Okay, good. So now we know how to solve a buffer problem. But how does buffering work? So let's assume we have a relatively large amount of um, HA, the weak acid, and its conjugate base A minus. If we add a strong base, so if we add OH minus to our solution that contains HA and A minus, this, this is our buffer solution, what happens? So OH minus is such a strong base that it will um, react with the best proton source, the HA, right? So, and um, it will convert HA to A minus and produce water. So the OH minus ions are not allowed to accumulate, but are replaced by A minus ions, okay? So we can understand this better um, by looking at the equilibrium expression for the dissociation of the weak acid. So Ka is equal to the concentration of um, H plus times the concentration of A minus over the concentration of HA. We can rearrange this equation to get this equation, so H plus, the concentration of H plus is equal to Ka times the concentration of HA over the concentration of A minus. So we see that this concentration, the equilibrium concentration of H plus, which determines the pH, is determined by this ratio. So the ratio of the concentration of HA over the concentration of A minus. So when OH minus, a strong base, um, is added to um, the solution, then the, the OH minus will react with HA and H will be converted to A minus. So um, the ratio, this ratio will decrease. However, if we have large quantities of the HA and A minus, this change in the ratio will be small, okay? This is how buffering works. So we add OH minus, in summary, we add OH minus, and um, this reacts with the HA, and HA becomes A minus, but the concentration of HA and A minus in our buffer solution are large compared to the amount of 
the um, OH minus that's added. So the final um, ratio, the HA to A minus ratio, is close to the original ratio. The same rule applies when we add um, H plus, a strong acid. So when a strong acid is added to a buffer solution, the strong acid will react with the base, the A minus, and A minus will be converted to HA. However, if the amount of the HA and A minus are so large, then this ratio, the ratio of HA to A minus, uh, will not increase very much. Okay, so this ratio will be close to the original ratio. From the equilibrium expression for the dissociation of the weak acid, we can get a very useful equation called the henderson hasselbalch equation, uh, which relates um, pH with pKa and the ratio of A minus to HA, okay? So if we rearrange this equation, we get H plus concentration equals to Ka times HA over A minus. And if we take the negative log of both sides, okay, we'll take the negative log of both sides, then minus log H plus concentration is pH, and the minus log Ka is pKa, right? So we get pH equals to pKa plus, we'll switch positions here, so that we get plus, plus log um, of the concentration of A minus over the concentration of HA. A minus is the conjugate base and HA is a weak acid, okay? There are important assumptions that we make when using the henderson hasselbalch equation. Um, it is that um, we assume that the equilibrium concentration of A minus is equal to the initial concentration of A minus and the equilibrium concentration of HA is equal to the initial concentration of HA. Since buffers contain large amounts um, of the initial concentrations of um, A minus and HA, um, these assumptions are generally acceptable when using buffers. So we can use the henderson hasselbalch equation to find the pH for um, a given buffer. For a particular buffer system that contains a conjugate acid base pair, all solutions that have the same ratio of A minus to HA will have the same pH based on the henderson hasselbalch equation. Okay. So in summary, buffers contain relatively large concentrations of a weak acid and the corresponding weak base. And if H plus, a strong acid, is added to the buffer, it reacts to completion with the weak base. And if um, OH minus, a strong base, is added to um, a buffer solution, it will react with the weak acid to completion. Okay. And the pH in the buffer solution is determined by the ratio of the concentrations of the weak acid and the weak base. So based on the henderson hasselbalch equation. Okay? And as long as this ratio, the base to acid ratio, remains constant, the pH will virtually um, remain constant. And this will be the case as long as the concentrations of the buffering materials, the HA and the A-, or if we're using a weak base, the conjugate acid is the, B, uh, conjugate acid is, is the BH plus, um, are large compared with amounts of the added H plus or OH minus, okay? Okay, then what is um, buffering capacity then? So buffering capacity is the amount of protons or hydroxides um, the buffer can absorb without changing um, the pH significantly. A buffer with large capacity contains um, large concentrations of the buffering components, so um, oh, the uh, conjugate acid base pair. And the buffering capacity is determined by the magnitudes of the HA concentration and the A minus concentration, whereas the pH, the pH of a buffer solution is determined by the ratio, right? The ratio of the um, concentration of A minus to um, the concentration of HA. 
So uh, in this example, we have two solutions that um, contain both the acidic acid and um, acetate. So this is a buffer solution, okay? So both are buffer solutions that contain the same components. However, in solution A, we have 5.00 molar of, and, uh, of the acetic acid and the acetate. And in the solution B, we have only 0.050 molar acetic acid and the acetate. In both of these solutions, we're adding 0.010 mole of hydrogen chloride gas. Um, and let's see what happens when, when a strong acid is added, okay? So in both cases, the ratio of the concentration of A minus to the concentration of HA is one, right? We have the same um, amount of the uh, weak acid and the conjugate base, right? When H plus is added, when a strong acid is added, what happens to this ratio? For solution A, we see that this ratio changes from one, one to 0.996. Whereas for solution B, this ratio changes from 1.0 to a smaller number, so, um, 0 0.67. Okay, which one produces a larger change? Solution B, right? So which one then has a larger buffering capacity? Is it solution A or solution B? Buffering capacity refers to the amount of H plus and, um, or OH minus the buffer can absorb without changing the pH significantly. So, Solution A, right? Solution A has a larger buffering capacity. So the buffering capacity is determined by the magnitudes of the buffering components. So we have, so in solution five, we have uh, solution A, we have five molars, and in solution B, we have 0.05. So the one that has larger amount of the com buffering components has a larger buffering capacity. Okay. So when choosing a buffer. What are the factors that we need to consider other than the buffering capacity? So to answer that question, um, let's compare two solutions. Uh, we have solution A and B. And in solution A, so both the solutions contain um, acetic acid and acetate. But in solution A, the ratio of the concentration of the acetate to the concentration of acetic acid is one, meaning that we have same amounts of the acetate and the acetic acid. But in solution B, this ratio um, is 100, okay? What happens um, to this ratio when 0.01 mole of a strong acid is added? We see that uh, in solution A, the ratio changes by 2.00%. Whereas in solution B, this ratio changes much more. It's 50.5%. Which buffer solution would you choose? Would you choose A or B? Do you want to have your buffer to change it in its pH a lot or less? Less, right? So we would choose buffer A, right? Um, so when the ratio of the concentration of A minus to HA is least affected by the added protons or hydroxide ions, the solution is the most resistant to a change in pH. So um, the function of the buffer is to resist a change in pH when protons or hydroxide ions are added. Okay, so when choosing a buffer, uh, we have to keep in mind that large changes in the ratio of the um, base to acid will produce large changes in pH. So for optimal buffering, for optimal buffering, we want to have the, the concentration of HA to be equal to the concentration of A minus. Okay, so then this ratio becomes one and pH is equal to pKa. So pKa of the weak acid to be useful in the buffer, for, so for optimal buffering, should be as close as possible to the desired pH, okay? So, does this make sense? Okay. 
Okay, now let's look at um, acid-base titrations and see how the pH changes um, during our titration process. Okay, recall from chapter four, we, we learned about acid-base titrations. A titration refers to um, the delivery, usually from a burette, um, of a measured volume of a solution of known concentrations. We, we call this the titrant into a solution containing the substance being analyzed, which is the analyte, okay? So in this picture, we have um, the titrant in the burette, and we add the titrant to um, the solution of the, of the unknown solution, um, which is called the analyte, uh, which is now here in the Erlenmeyer flask, okay? And um, the progress of the acid-base titration can be monitored by plotting the pH of the solution being analyzed as a function of the amount of titrant added. And this, such a plot is called a pH curve or titration curve, okay? So we have pH in the y-axis and the volume of um, the, the titrant is, uh, is in the x-axis, okay? And the equivalence or stoichiometric point is the point in the titration when enough titrant has been added to react exactly with the substance in solution being titrated. Okay, so let's look at a strong acid, strong base titration. So here we have 50.0 mils of 0.200 molar strong acid, nitric acid, HNO3, with um, um, point uh, 0.100 molar strong base, NaOH. At our first step, at point A, when no sodium hydroxide has been added, what is the pH? Well, first let's look about, look, um, let's, let's see what the major species are. So since we have only the nitric acid, which is a strong acid, um, the major species are H+, NO3 minus nitrate and water, right? And the, uh, and the concentration of H plus is then 0 0.200 molar, which is the same concentration of the added HNO3 because this is a strong acid, okay? And the pH, which is a negative log of the concentration of H plus is 0.699, okay? If we mark our, um, our point A on the pH curve here, uh, we can mark it right here, okay? It'll be right here. And um, before we move on, um, since titrations involve small quantities, it's more convenient to use millimoles um, in, uh, instead of moles. So millimoles over milliliters is equal to molar concentration, which we know that's equal, equal to moles per liter, okay? So um, in this step, in, in, uh, for step B, Let's add 10.0 milliliters of um, the 0 0.100 molar NaOH, okay? And let's see what happens. So now we have a strong acid and some base is added, okay? Before any reaction occurs, what are the major species? So we have a strong acid, right? And we're adding a strong base. So everything will dissociate completely into its ions. So we have H plus, NO3 minus, and Na plus and OH minus from the NaOH and water, okay? So let's do the calculations. So we want to know how much we're left with um, um, after the reaction. So we have a strong acid and a strong base, so a neutralization reaction will occur, um, right? So for H plus, um, if we calculate the number of moles of H plus, we multiply the volume by the concentration, uh, which then gives us 10.0 millimoles. And the, constant, uh, the number of moles for um, OH minus is 1.00 millimoles. Which one is the limiting rea reagent? It is, the, it is OH minus, right? So all of the OH minus will be used up, okay? So after the reaction, we have 9.0 millimoles of H+. And, now, and after the reaction, 
we don't have any OH minus anymore. Okay, so the major species then are um, H plus, NO3 minus, and Na plus and H2O. Okay, <coughs> what is the concentration of H plus then? We know the moles, the, um, we have 9.0 millimoles of H plus, and the concentration is moles per liter or millimoles per milliliters, and the total volume is 50.0 milliliters plus the added volume. Um, so it's 10.0 mils, okay? So we have 60.0 milliliters um, um, for a, uh, in this solution. So the concentration becomes 0.15 molar concentration and the pH is 0.82, okay? If we mark um, point B on the pH curve, um, it's right here, okay? Now um, let's add 20.0 mils of 0 0.100 molar NaOH. Um, we follow the same steps, okay? We follow the same procedures. And if we um, calculate the amount of H plus that we are left with, we get 8.0 millimoles, okay? And after the reaction, since we used up all the OH minus, we're left with H plus, NO3 minus, Na plus, and water. So the concentration of H plus is then 8.0 millimoles over the total volume, which is 50 plus 20, okay? And this is the concentration and pH is 0.94, okay? And we do the same thing when we add 50.0 mils of NaOH and we get a pH of 1.30. Do this um, yourself at home, okay? Now, at point E, we're adding 100.0 mils of 0.100 molar NaOH. Okay, let's calculate the amount of hydroxide ions that has been added. It's 10.0 millimoles, okay? And this is the same amount of um, the H plus ions that's present. So we have equal amounts of the OH minus and the H plus. Both are 10.0 millimoles. This is the stoichiometry, or um, the equivalence point. So enough OH minus has been added to react exactly with the H plus from the nitric acid. So there is a, a neutralization reaction between the two to form water. And now the major species are NO3 minus and Na plus in water. We don't have any H plus or um, OH minus. We know that um, Na plus is neither acidic nor basic in, in water, and NO3 minus is a very weak base. So neither the NO3 minus nor the Na plus will affect the pH, and the solution is neutral, okay? So the pH at this point, at the stoichiometric point, is seven, okay? So if we uh, mark uh, point D and E on our titration curve was right here, D over here and E right here, okay? So now let's add 150.0 mils of the 0.100 molar NaOH, okay? Now we see that after the reaction, we're left with no H plus concentration. Everything has been used up okay? and we have excess OH minus. So we're left with 5.0 millimoles of OH minus. So the concentration of OH minus is then 5.0 millimoles over the total volume. So we added um, 150 to 50, right? So the total volume becomes 200. And the concentration is now 0.025 molar concentration, right? And we can calculate the concentration of H plus using the relationship between Kw and H plus and OH minus, and we get 4.0 times 10 to the negative 13. And the pH for this concentration is 12.40, okay? So if we mark all of our points, uh, point um, A to point G, then it looks like this, and if we monitor the pH, um, um, 
as we add the NaOH, we get this kind of curve, okay? Note that there is a, uh, a gradual change in the pH before near the equivalence point and after the equivalence point. However, um, near the equivalence point, we see a dramatic change. And this is because in this region, <coughs> we have a relatively large amount of H+. Plus, so adding a small amount of OH- minus will not affect the pH much. It will not change the pH significantly. But near the equivalence point, now we, ha we have small amounts of H+. Plus, so adding a small amount of OH- minus um, of significantly um, changes the pH. So we see a dramatic change here. <coughs> and um, the pH curve for the titration of a strong base with a strong acid looks like this. So the only difference is that um, before the equivalence point, we have excess OH minus, right? Because we start with an NaOH, uh, with a solution of NaOH. And after the equivalence point, we have excess um, H plus, okay? In both cases, the equivalence point is at pH 7, which is characteristic of a strong acid, strong base titration. At the equivalence point, there are no components that produce acidic or um, basic um, properties. So that's why we see a pH of 7 at the equivalence point. Okay, so that's um, all I have for today. We'll continue with the weak acid and strong base titration next class. Next class will be in two weeks, right? Two weeks, so we have a long break. Um, so use that time to prepare for the midterm exam and um, hope you have, oh, also, there will be a quiz in two weeks, okay, on, on chapter 14, right? So um, enjoy your break and have um, a happy chuseok. Okay. Okay. Thank you.